Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I see people joining us today, and I want to just give you a big welcome on this morning. I'm going to get us started in a few seconds as I see um, our room populating. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar on the Triangulum of Cannabis, Tobacco, and E-Cigarette Use, Its Effect on Physical Health, Addiction, and Mental Health, and How You Can Best Help. We have over 230 folks who registered for this webinar today, so many health champions and youth advocates from across the state and from outside of the state who are dedicated to supporting the well-being of young people. So we're really grateful to have you here with us to continue our ongoing work of learning and adapting to the ever-changing landscape of tobacco, e-cigarettes, and cannabis use, and its intersections with youth mental health. The work that each of you does to support youth is invaluable and profoundly impactful, especially today in our complex and stressful world. So I want to first just thank our funders, which is the California Department of Education, the TUPI program, Tobacco um, Education, Education Tobacco Use Prevention. Um, thanks for their support. Today's webinar is being recorded. We will be posting the slides as well as the recording on our website in the next few days. Um, we will also be sending them out to all of you who have registered. So you will receive the slides and recording um, and any of our additional resources that we share with you. Uh, we have the Q&A feature enabled. So if you have questions that you'd like our presenter to answer, feel free to put those in the Q&A or in the chat is also fine. And just to let you know a little bit about the California School-Based Health Alliance, if you're not familiar with us, we are a statewide nonprofit and we are dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. So our work is really grounded in two concepts, that healthcare should be accessible and available where kids are, and that schools should have the services needed to ensure the best outcomes and to ensure that poor health is not a barrier to learning. So we do this through a lot of um, capacity building and technical assistance and trainings and webinars like this one today. So we're gonna put in the chat, or we already have put in the chat, um, links to find out more about our organization and resources. We also host an annual conference um, that happens every year in the spring. This year, it's gonna be in Anaheim on April 28th and 29th. It's a really fantastic in-person gathering of school health champions from across the state. So please save the date for we'd love to have you with us. Um, and also, if your organization is not a member of the California School-Based Health Alliance, please consider joining. Um, when you join, it, it offers conference registration discounts, so it's really worthwhile if you're planning to come to our conference, as well as technical assistance that's tailored to your organization. So I'm going to introduce our presenter today um, and let her get started. Um, we are so pleased to have such expertise with us for this webinar. Dr. Bonnie Halpern Felscher is the Marin and Mary Elizabeth Kendrick Professor in Pediatrics in the Division of Adolescent Medicine, Department of Pediatrics at Stanford University. She's a developmental psychologist with a specialization in adolescent and young adult health. She's also the founder and executive director of the Stanford Reach Lab the Tobacco Prevention Toolkit, the Cannabis Awareness and Prevention Toolkit, the Vaping Information Solutions and Interventions Toolkit, and Safety First Comprehensive Drug Prevention Program. She's also the president of the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine, and her research is focused on understanding and reducing adolescent and young adult, adult tobacco, marijuana, and other drug use. 
And her research includes over 200 publications. Her committee and advocacy work have been really instrumental in setting policy at the state, local, and the national level. So there's more to her bio that I won't even mention here, but just to say we're really thrilled to have her share her experience with us today. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing so she can bring up her slides and welcome again to Dr. Bonnie halpern -Felsher. Thank you so much, Amy. And hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Great to, well, I can't see you, but great to have you all here. Oh, are you seeing the, okay. We're good. All right. Fantastic. So um, I'm, uh, I think I'm just going to dive right in. Uh, please do feel free to ask questions in the chat or in the q and I'm pretty good at seeing questions uh, and, and following along as we go. If not, we'll have time at the end for questions. And if you are wanting a copy of my slides, uh, Amy has them, but you can also email me that for them. So first, REACH, what's the REACH Lab? REACH stands for Research and Education to Empower Adolescents and Young Adults to Choose Health. I have a pretty large, robust lab. I won't read everybody's name in the interest of time, but just know that we are um, supported in our lab by researchers, educators, public health lawyers, public health specialists, a psychiatrist, and adolescent medicine doc, and full-time graphic designers. We also have a robust REACH Lab YAB, our Youth Action Board. These are a very large group. We have 38 young people who advise us on everything that we do in the lab. And shout out to our sponsors, including Tupay as well. All right. So let's talk. So I'm going to talk about tobacco and nicotine products, then I'm going to talk about cannabis products, then I'm going to talk about co-use, which is the most important part of today, and then the health effects and end with what you can do. So let's talk about, and I'm going to use tobacco and nicotine fairly interchangeably. So as you know, uh, probably know about e-cigarettes. I'm, I'm pretty sure you do. Uh, e-cigarettes came on the market in the United States in 2007. When they first came on the market, they looked like cigarettes. We called them first-generation cigalikes. Teens weren't using them very often. But then as they changed over time, and particularly in 2015, when Juul came on the market, we saw a very huge jump in the percentage of adolescents using these products daily or weekly or monthly. And now we're seeing just a nonstop proliferation of different kinds of e-cigarettes. And with the exception of the Bic lighters that you're seeing here, you can see the swath of different kinds of e-cigarettes that are out there on the market. Ones that look like boxes or they look like highlighters or they look like USBs and so on. And, it, and I'm going to show you some more pictures as we go. It's pretty much endless, the kinds of products that are out there. I do want to talk about a couple other nicotine products, though, that are important for you to know about. Certainly, we know about Zin. Hopefully, you know about Zin. Do I have one more slide on that? Yeah. I know about Zin. I'll talk about that in a second. We also are seeing teens using tablets and lozenges, toothpicks, yes, nicotine toothpicks, and gum. It's important to know that many teens are using these different oral nicotine products, not as a way to quit um, smoking cigarettes or to stop vaping, but really as just an additional nicotine product. And then some were worried, not a lot of good evidence yet, but some were worried are then transitioning from these oral nicotine products over to combustible forms of nicotine. So let's talk about Zen. Uh, and I'm curious if you want to put in the chat, how many of you are seeing Zen a lot in your schools and are worried about Zen? I'm worried about Zen. We've published a couple of papers on Zen, also some newspaper articles on it. Zen are these little white pillow pouches, and the image is a little bit blurry, I'm sorry, but you can kind of see them in the top right image there. Little white pack pouches. They contain nicotine and nitrosamines and other chemicals. They don't contain tobacco, which is why they're not yellow or brown. It's a process of pulling out the tobacco, the nicotine's left. The nicotine is derived from the tobacco in many cases. And then you put the uh, the pouch between your gum and your cheek. And this is often referred to as upper decking for teens where they'll put multiple pouches up in their, in their um, lip area, their mouth area. 
Now, Zin comes in a three and a six milligram uh, version. We, we don't have enough data to know what percentage teens are most likely using. But if you're using a six milligram uh, piece, one cigarette, just one cigarette has enough, um, has as much nicotine as, as about one milligram of nicotine, maybe two milligrams of nicotine. So a pack of cigarettes has 20, 25 milligrams of nicotine. If you're using a six milligram pouch of Zin and putting two or three in your mouth at the same time, it's about a half a pack of cigarettes at least. And then if you do that throughout the day, you're actually getting as more nicotine that we than what we see in a pack of cigarettes. So very concerning amount of nicotine there. And we do know that teens are using Zin and we're concerned that that rate of, of use is actually going up. All right, so let's talk about cannabis products and we're gonna spend more time on cannabis. So there are different kinds of cannabis products that are on the market. We certainly are aware of the combustible products like um, uh, joint, uh, which stand at a joint and teens are still using joints even though they don't like to smoke cigarettes. Uh, tobacco cigarettes, certainly joints are still smoking. Blunts are also very popular. Blunts are cigars where the tobacco's pulled out and they'll put in the cannabis flavor or the cannabis flower in there, or you can buy a cigar wrapper and, and put in your flower. And then spliffs on the bottom here, bottom left, that is al almost like a cigarette that has uh, with paper that has the cannabis in there. We're also worried about and very concerned about these dabbing or dab pens. Dabbing, these other products have around 20% THC. Dabbing has upwards of 80% THC, a huge amount of THC in these products. And we're very worried about it because probably not going to die, but when you put in, or you're not going to die, an overdose on it. But if you're driving under the influence or other things like that, that's also where we're very concerned about you. And that's with these products here. We also have uh, e-cigarette versions of cannabis where you can vape it or inhale it that way. And then you've got your pipes and your bonks. Anything you inhale in the form of nicotine and or cannabis takes roughly 10 seven to 10, uh, five to 10 seconds to fill the effect. So it goes through lungs, bloodstream into your brain pretty quickly. Uh, and the high lasts for 30 minutes to several hours. And it depends on the metabolism, your weight and so on. Now, cannabis edibles, which is what we're seeing at this bottom right here. These are your brownies, cookies, gummies that we're very worried about few things why we're worried. One is they look like household foods and desserts, and they're very popular because of that. We've seen more little kids, elementary school kids, getting their older siblings or their parents cannabis-infused gummy bears, for example, thinking that they're just candy and getting sick from that. The other problem that we worry about a lot with these edibles is that teens don't realize they might smoke and feel the effects pretty quickly. But when they're using cannabis edibles, it takes 20 minutes to two hours to feel the effect versus the almost immediate effect that we see in the inhaled. So if it takes 20 minutes to two hours, you might say, huh, I'm not feeling the effect and have more. Huh, I'm not feeling the effect and have more and keep having more and more until you're addicted to the, or you're getting addicted, yes, but you're also getting sick. And it's often because even with legalization in California and other states, it's still hard to regulate these products. So how much cannabis you're getting in the product in one cookie may be unclear. And typically a cookie is not the serving size. It's usually maybe a quarter of the cookie or even less than that. But think about it. When you've been given a cookie, can you eat just half or a quarter of it? We generally finish it. So we're seeing a lot of concerns of young people getting sick because of dose and dosage. They're using too much with edibles. Now, I mentioned THC. Uh, the current THC products are upward around 20%. Back in my childhood, it was somewhere in the 5 to 10% range, more like 5%. Today's joint is worth about 10 joints when I was a kid. 
So very, very high potency THC products we see right now. And it depends on the method. It depends on the flower, but in general, very high amounts of THC. And this is concerning because as I'll show you soon, THC alters the brain and can make you very sick. And a lot of times people don't realize, they think that they're using, oh, you know, grandma or mom use, it's not a big deal. It's not the same product. Um, in California, you may have seen, and, and Amy, please remind me uh, to send this to you if I haven't already, or if you don't know of it, um, a group of people, and I was involved in this, uh, put together a report for the California State and for California Department of Public Health talking about high THC products and how we're concerned about it and how we really want to get flavors out and we want to reduce the THC. Currently, in the U.S. and in California, there is no standard of the upper limit for nicotine or THC. It's just ridiculous how much is in there. So in our area for advocacy, if you're interested. Now I wanna talk about Delta-8 and hemp quickly. Still learning more and more about this, but Delta-8, what I've talked about so far is your Delta-9, but there's also Delta-8. And Delta-8 is a synthetic form of cannabis that is less potent than the Delta-9s that I've been talking about. And it's derived from hemp. We extract the THC from the hemp plant. So what does this mean? Let's talk about hemp and why we're concerned. So hemp is the plant it's, that is in the uh, class of cannabis sativa that comes in very low THC levels by, by nature. Naturally, hemp has very low THC versus uh, the cannabis flower itself. And hemp is typically used for fibers, creams, other goods that you may be aware of. In its natural form, it is legal. So it's legal to grow and to, to produce and to create fibrous creams, et cetera, out of it. In the U.S. and often across the country, the edible hemp products are legal to sell and use with no age limit if derived from raw hemp with the THC that's less than 0.3%. Now, inhaled hemp is illegal in California, by the way, important to know. So what's intoxicating hemp that we're seeing a lot of young people get sick from? So intoxicating hemp is chemically altered to increase the THC levels from the hemp to intoxicating levels that's similar to Delta 9. It comes in inhaled and edible forms. And the problem is because it comes from hemp, as opposed to to from the cannabis plant, the regulation of intoxicating hemp has been vague and that there are many, many loopholes. So this is one of the main concerns that we have. There's something called the Farmer's Bill that I only recently learned about. And in the Farmer's Bill, um, you can grow hemp. And that's how they get around this because they're saying, well, I'm just growing hemp. Yeah, but you're, you're changing the chemistry to be able to increase the intoxication of it. Now in California, Intoxicating hemp, there's an emergency, uh, I don't know if it's a bill or, or order that was put out by Governor Newsom. And in that in that emergency order, um, intoxicating hemp is kind of on hold. And so we're going to see. But again, something that we're concerned about. For those of you who might be in Marin, we're definitely seeing, um, I, I, people have told me a lot of concerns about intoxicating hemp uh, use and, and uh, young people getting sick. All right co-use of cannabis and tobacco, we're seeing a lot of co-use. Let me tell you what I mean by that. So co-use, and particularly in the science, I'm a scientist in the scientific community, has different definitions. So I want to kind of set the bar here, or make it clear. So one definition of co-use is use of cannabis and tobacco at the same time. So this is your blunts, or say you take a nicotine e-cigarette, and then inhale half of it, and then add in the cannabis oil. And I had a young man who said to me, yes, I bought a cherry-flavored nicotine e-cigarette. I inhaled half, and then I added in the cannabis oil, and he was all excited and said, and now I have a nicotine cannabis combined product um, that's flavored. The other way that we can talk about co-use is cannabis and tobacco within a short period of time chasing it's called. So it enhances the high when you combine tobacco and cannabis. And then ever or past 30 day use is another definition. So you might be somebody who's used 
cannabis today and and nicotine yesterday so not next to each other around the same time but you're a user of both products so different definitions so you when you read up or you hear about co-use make sure that you're asking people to define what you're talking about or what they're talking about so here's just a photo from a, a county from in California. I think this is Marin County of all the products that were confiscated over a short period of time. And they took a picture for me. And you can look at all the different products young people are using. They're still using e-cigarettes, nicotine e-cigarettes, but you can see Zin in there. You can see some cannabis. You can tell cannabis, like more the plas or the glass style. There's one here the cannabis is being used. So you can see that teens are just using all kinds of products uh, across campus and getting them confiscated. So what are the rates of this co-use? So past 30 day use, which is our st standard measure of use of both cannabis and, and tobacco is very high. At least five to 30% of adolescents and young adults in the US report using co-use in the past 30 days. And I would actually argue rates are probably even higher. This is just the data, but people aren't always honest. And then a lot of studies, including ours, suggest that co-use is more prevalent than sole use of nicotine, tobacco, or cannabis alone. So people are using both products more often uh, than they are using just one or the other. And we, sh we published a paper recently, and again, I'm happy to send you any papers, just let me know. It showed amongst adolescents, young adults, and adults across the country, so 13 to 40-year-olds, that almost about 38% reported using both cannabis and tobacco in the past month. Almost 71% used tobacco first. This is important. I was hypothesizing cannabis would be used first, but it's tobacco. And what it's typically, the last bullet there is it's e-cigarettes. So the pattern seems to be people are starting with e-cigarettes, nicotine e-cigarettes, moving towards cannabis and moving towards cannabis within one to two years of starting nicotine. So a lot of co-use going on. And this is some data from one of my, po a different postdoc of mine, uh, Jessica Liu, so to give her a shout out. And these are a bunch of different studies she did as a grad student. And I'm basically just showing you uh, very quickly that dual use of e-cigarettes and cannabis was always higher, these are national data, than sole use of e-cigarettes, uh, cannabis, or other products that might be used. So again, that dual use of cigarettes and e-cigarettes, or excuse me, e-cigarettes and cannabis very high. She did another study of tw in 2023, smaller sample, and showing there that again, a, a higher percentage, 7.3 versus just about 5.6, we're using both products. So even in these smaller studies, a lot of people are using. And then this was a study of a very small study of, of young people who looked at which one did you start using first, and it was nicotine. So just the my point there is across a number of different studies, we're seeing co-use, and across a number of different studies, we're seeing nicotine first, then cannabis, and then um. Uh, and then some are using both simultaneously in the form of a blunt or whatever. And young people don't understand the health effects, which I'm going to talk about, that the health effects are basically, I don't know if you want to say doubled or tripled, but they are, they are higher when you're using both products, more likely to become addicted, more issues with mental health, addiction, and so on. So we also know from other studies that about 33% of high school students and 23% of middle school students who have ever used a nicotine e-cigarette reported using cannabis in that e-cigarette as well. So youth who vape are three and a half times more likely to use cannabis than those who don't. So again, adding more evidence. So this is really important when you're asking teens, what are they using? You get very specific because they could be smoking or vaping cannabis or tobacco. So this is a video I just want to show you. Another video of confiscated goods. Um, this is a few years ago, actually, but I think it's really important. By the way, 
you guys are confiscating project products and ever want to send me pictures or videos, I'd always appreciate it. Just tell me where it came from. I won't, I won't out the school, but um, because it helps keep me current with the latest products and what's being found. And it's also good when I give talks to parents who say, oh, no, no, not my school. Yeah, it's happening in your area as well. So I always appreciate it. Anyway, this is a video that somebody took of products that they confiscated, and I'll show it to you once, and I'll, then I'll explain, I'll show it to you again. There's no sound. So the point I'm making, yes, on the right, there are some images of cigars and cigarillos, but more look at the fact that it's hard to tell whether what the student's using is nicotine or cannabis. Generally, the plastic and metal are can or um, nicotine, and generally the glass or plastic, uh, excuse me, the glass or plastic style are cannabis, but you can't always tell the difference. And I'll play it one more time. You can also just see the wide variety. This is before disposables became very popular, like Elf Bar. This is more in the Jewel Views era. All right. All right, so let's talk about health effects. Any questions on the products themselves? And there'll be time at the end, but. All right. All right, so our body on cannabis and or tobacco Lots of concerns, and I'll go through and talk about these a little bit more one by one. But one of the things to be most, uh, oops, come on, to be most concerned about is addiction. Both cannabis and tobacco, and when you're co-using, even more lead to addiction. We know that our brains continue to develop until around age 25, right? 24, 26, 28, right around 25. And we know, and this is how we talk about it in our curriculums, by the way, we give a very optimistic view. We're trying to tell teens the fact that your brain's still developing, it makes you cool, it's great, it's why you ask questions, it's why you're so creative. But at the same time, while your brain's developing, you're also so much more likely to become addicted. And that's because these drugs actually change the brain chemistry, especially before you have fully matured in your brain. So that's really important to know. We also know, and I'll talk about all of these a little bit more, that cannabis and or nicotine increase heart rate, cause lung damage, poor muscle control, coordinates and falling, and then has effects on the gut, uh, particularly cannabis. So let's talk about this a little bit more. So let's talk about drugs and the brain. So we know that both nicotine and in the form of an e-cigarette and other forms and cannabis are addictive. Now that may seem obvious, why am I emphasizing that? It's surprising how many people tell me that they've heard that cannabis is not addictive or they believe it's not addictive. It is highly addictive to, for young people. And you also get tolerance and withdrawal going on there. So tolerance where you need more and more to feel the same effects. So addiction is real and it's important for us to talk to teens about it. But we also know with cannabis in particular that you get impaired learning, memory, attention, impulse control, decision-making problems. So teens who are using cannabis, and then again, if they're using cannabis and, e and nicotine uh, in the form of e-cigarettes or other form, you're enhancing some of these impairments. Also lower academic performance and loss of IQ points with repeated use. Sleep. Just had a debate on sleep earlier today in another um, talk I was giving. When you talk about sleep, cannabis can help you sleep, but it's a drug sleep. It's not a real sleep. And then you wind up becoming dependent on using cannabis to fall asleep instead of letting your body's natural reactions happen for being able to fall asleep. And we know that the higher the dose and more regular the use, the greater the impairment. And important to tell young people, whereas the heart can heal, lungs, eh, depending, brain isn't healing. You are losing those IQ points in the academic achievement and so on if you are using uh, uh, cannabis and or nicotine. 
All right. We also know that both to tobacco and cannabis used separately or together have effects on the lungs. Probably not surprising. I will spend a few slides on this. First of all, it can inflame and irritate the airways. It can destroy the air sacs in the lungs. And we know through a number of studies, particularly with cigarettes, but it's true for any tobacco product and certainly for cannabis as well, because anything you're inhaling, that you can have a weaker immune response to infection. In fact, I know um, I'm here in New York uh, this week for a bunch of meetings. We know that um, uh, we we know that if you are uh, that there are doctors who will not perform elective surgery on teens who are vaping because they're very worried about the immune system and healing. All right, let's talk about pulmonary effects, lungs, additional effects. There's something called so. A lot of these e-cigarettes, whether it's cannabis, nicotine, or non-nicotine, which I didn't show you a picture of, but you can also, you know, you could vape your caffeine, you could vape your melatonin, you could vape vitamins. It's a problem. It's called Monk or Cloudy, different brands. They're not regulated, and they come in a lot of different flavors. So even though there's not nicotine or tobacco in them or, or cannabis, there, there are vaping device. No matter what kind of device you're using, whether there's THC, nicotine, or nothing in there in terms of a psychoactive or addictive substance, the flavors themselves can be harmful. We get a lot of people, I'm sure you've heard this, oh, it's just harmless water vapor, or it's just flavored water. The flavor, First of all, it's probably not. They're probably putting something else in there. But even if it was just so-called harmless without THC or nicotine in there, just the idea of inhaling flavors is a problem. So there's something in the government called GRASS, generally recognized as safe for oral, but not for inhalation. So you can inhale, you can heat, sorry, you can heat butter to several hundred degrees and eat it. You might burn your tongue, but you'll be fine. But you heat butter or diacetyl, which is the buttery flavor in these e-cigarettes. That's also in uh, butter, microwavable popcorn. You can heat it and then inhale the resulting aerosol. And that's where we're seeing the issues. So flavors like diacetyl, the buttery flavor, or vanillin, which is a vanilla flavor, or um, cinnamon aldehyde, cinnamon flavor, which also is an aldehyde, a cancer-causing agent, or um, T-bone steak, believe it or not. These are flavors that can be very harmful to our bodies and our lungs in particular. So you may have heard of something called Evoli, e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury. Uh, curious if you put in the chat if you've heard of this or if you know of young people with Evoli. Evoli is where the oily substance, particularly from cannabis and the vitamin E acetate is going through and clogging the arteries of the lungs. And the problem that we're having there, oh yeah, somebody is having some, uh, having uh, knows about that. Um, when you clog the arteries of it, of your lungs, basically is what's happening, not, her, not your heart, you're clogging your lungs. Um, <clears throat> uh, like we're seeing in the middle image here, then we're more likely to have issues um, around breathing and respiratory issues and pretty scary stuff going on. So as of February of 2020, the CDC reported Centers for Disease Control about 28 cases of e-cigarettes or uh, vaping associated lung illness almost 70 deaths overall. Uh, yes, they do talk about, I, I was in big vape. I don't know if you knew that uh, for, for a few seconds. And then, um, and then I'm in the book all over it, which is uh, scary. Um, oh, something's up. Okay. Um, so the problem is that the uh, CDC stopped collecting data on Evoli. I know we had the pandemic, but we're still seeing young people with Evoli and we're still concerned about it. <clears throat> and we're concerned about it uh, largely because uh, one is it presents similarly to COVID. So it's hard to know the difference until a doctor's worked you up. And we're very worried about lung issues, lung collapses and so forth. So smoking, vaping and COVID, speaking of COVID, 
We know that lungs are weakened from breathing in smoke or aerosol. And, and by the way, that's true for our California smoke as well. Um, we know that the novel coronavirus attacks the lungs. And we know that weakened lungs at greater risk for, or if you have uh, weak lungs, you're at greater risk for severe COVID infection. We published a study in August of 2020 amongst adolescents and young adults that also showed that adolescents and young adults who were vaping, vaping anything, were so much more likely to be diagnosed. So presence or absence, not severity, but diagnosed with COVID. Now, we don't know if it's the lungs. We also think it may be that <clears throat> during the pandemic, the heat of the pandemic, young people maybe were in the backyard, but they were removing their masks. Maybe they were hand to mouth and sharing the products. Uh, the, the coronavirus seems to be coming out of that big plume of aerosol. And I talked to some teens who said, oh, Dr. Bonnie, we're, we're, we're standing six feet apart and sharing our vape. And you're thinking, oh, let's talk about infectious disease control. So a lot of concern around smoking, vaping and COVID and lung illness overall. There's also something called cannabis hyperemesis. What was the 56 plus? I think I missed that connection, but please let me know. Um, there's something called cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. This is where you're getting vomiting and severe abdominal pain from long-term use. And the symptoms will go away within a, a few days, but uh, unless the, the cannabis use is fully stopped. If you continue, then you're going to have more of the same effects. So cannabis and mental health, hallucinations and paranoia, depression, anxiety, cannabis use is associated with two to three times more likelihood of being psychotic. I want to make this clear and pause here for a second. More and more data is coming out, and a colleague of mine who's a psychiatrist in the UK who looks at addiction is convinced from the data that cannabis causes psychosis, causes schizophrenia, is not just associated with it. Now, it depends on age. It seems to be mostly that 17 to 21 year old. It depends on um, your weight, your metabolism, and if, certainly whether or not you have family history. But the point is, we don't know who's going to be the one to have a psychotic break or not. And that is one of the other things. I um, was talking to a woman who's 20, was 25 at the time. So brain fully developed. She bought cannabis and she told, she tells the story. I'm not revealing anything confidential. She um, uh, had, she lived in California. She was over 21 and she was using cannabis periodically, not very often. She was with her boyfriend and she they were using together and she didn't feel the effect. So he did something called packing. He put a whole bunch of, of uh, doses, basically, of cannabis flower into, I think it was a piper bong. I'm not 100% sure. And then she inhaled it and she had a psychotic break and went psychotic and took a knife and killed him killed her dog. She was hearing impaired, is hearing impaired. So had a special helper dog and then almost killed herself with the knife. When the police got there on the body cam, you could see she was completely gone. She did not know what she was doing. She was out of her mind, out of, out of body mind experience, had no idea what was going on. She was arrested, she was convicted, but the judge realized that that's what was happening was she was having a psychotic event. And so he actually sentenced her to three years of probation and giving talks about cannabis and mental health. She'll probably be coming to our conference, which I'll tell you about. All right, so there's a new study. Um, it's a great question. Uh, not, it could, and it seems to be better unless it moves over to schizophrenia. Um, but generally you can keep it at bay, but if you do something to, to aggravate it, abstinence, I think stress as well can re-aggravate and, and re basically have you have more psychosis. So it doesn't fully resolve just like nicotine addiction or cannabis addiction is still there. Even if you stop using, if you use again, um, so it's not fully gone, 
you can basically, you know, requeue it up to, to happen again. Yeah. And we're still learning on it. There's not a lot of information that we have and we need a lot more. Uh, we did a study, another publication recently that showed that nearly one in three uh, youth and young adults and adults in our study reported past 30 day co-use and half of those screened positive for depression. And we found that screening positive for depression was more likely amongst those who had used co-used tobacco and cannabis in the past 30 days, more likely than people who are using tobacco or cannabis alone. So, you know, this is mostly a talk about co-use that by themselves, nicotine, cannabis can be harmful, cannabis, mental health issues, actually nicotine and mental health as well, but using combination so much more likely to be experiencing some mental health issues. We also know about cannabis and suicidality in young people. Cannabis use is associated with 50% increase in uh, risk of suicidal ideation and three and a half percent increased risk of suicide attempt. All right, so let's talk about second and third hand aerosol and smoke. You probably have heard of secondhand smoke with cigarettes, but we're seeing secondhand smoke with e-cigarettes and with cannabis as well. So what do I mean? Here's an example of the secondhand aerosol, that huge plume of smoke, which is an aerosol that comes out of an e-cigarette. So this plume of, of aerosol, if you're standing next to somebody you're gonna, who's, who's vaping, you're going to be exposed to nicotine or THC if it's a THC product, heavy metals, ultrafine particles, cancerous causing chemicals, and volatile organic chemicals. So the point here is that aerosol, and as I mentioned before, could also have coronavirus in it. That aerosol itself is harmful, even if you are not the one using on your own. Now there's something called third hand aerosol or smoke as well. So when you smoke or vape, cannabis, nicotine, both, it goes into the air. It doesn't just dissipate, it has to go somewhere. So what happens is it mixes with the chemicals in the air, drops to the floor, the couches, the walls, clothing, and so on, and leaves toxic residue. This is harmful to the environment. And if you're a baby or a pet licking it, it could be harmful to you as well. So something that we also talk a lot about is not only second, but third hand effect. Now, what about cannabis in particular? So that secondhand smoke from cannabis contains cadmium, chromium, and benzene. Also, you probably have heard of Prop 65 that California has. What's on the Prop 65 list of toxins? There are over 33 toxins in that cannabis smoke. And full disclosure, my husband just got appointed to the California Environmental Protection Agency Prop 65 uh, committee. So he'll be able to help and think this through more. What are the chemicals that are causing cancer and other problems? We also know that that secondhand smoke can have effects on cardiovascular system and that children who've been exposed to somebody who's smoking uh, cannabis has detectable levels of cannabis THC in their bodies. And exposure, secondhand exposure is associated with breathing issues, ear infections, asthma, eczema, and so on. And that's not just cannabis, that's nicotine as well. And I often think of this as a social justice issue. In California, we have pretty good indoor air laws that uh, require one not to smoke cigarettes inside. And some of those policies include e-cigarettes as well. But what we're learning more and more, well, not learning, but what we need to advocate for is also cannabis being part of those laws as well. Because whether it's nicotine or cannabis or a combination when you smoke or vape in an apartment building, the air, the smoke from it goes from room to room, through the walls, through vents, windows, pipes, et cetera. So if you're living in multi-unit housing, you are also more likely to be exposed to second and third hand aerosol and smoke from a neighbor's use. And I consider this a social justice issue because if you're in multi-unit housing, you're more likely to have black and brown youth, low income, 
and my um, low income uh, people and young people who are living in those in those areas. And so it really is a social justice issue. Another point for advocacy. All right. Why youth use? So really important to understand the continuum of drug use amongst teens. And any time you go into a classroom and your classroom, you're either classroom educators or after school educators, whatever role you play, any time you go into a classroom, you have to realize that in that classroom, you're going to have teens who have never used students, who have never used all the way to regular use, weekend use, regular use, and then dependence and substance use disorder. So when you go in, and this gets to the pedagogy of teaching, when you go in and you basically are like, yeah, um, I'm sure you're not using and never use, you're going to have some students who say, wait, I have used, so you're not talking to me. What you're saying doesn't make any sense. And they completely shut off and they lose connection with you because you're not understanding them. So in the decision-making world, which is where I started my career, there are theories that say that teens can't judge risks, they believe that they're invulnerable to harm, they're peer pressured, which they are, and that they have poor decision-making skills. That's not necessarily the case. What I wanna argue is that it depends on teens' decision-making and what they put into the equation. You and I as adults may say, I'm worried about lung cancer, or I'm worried about teeth or other health issues. To a teen, they're worried about looking cool and, and being with their boyfriends or whatever it may be. They think about things differently. It's not that they don't think, but they think about it differently. So we don't have time to go into this, but think in your head, what are some good things about using dot, 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 your drug of choice? Let's say cannabis. Um, you know, probably, and if you want to throw in the chat, but um, probably you're thinking it makes you feel good makes you relax, makes you fit in, more social lubricant, and so on. So when we talk to teens and we say it's only bad, and a teen says, but 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 I used it yesterday and I really liked it, or my friends use it on the weekend and nothing bad happened to them, you've lost your credibility, you've lost your connection to the students. Now, I'm not saying that we go into a classroom and say, I'm sure a bunch of you are using and that's okay, no. We certainly have an expectation that they're not using, and if they are, that they're going to quit or cut back. But we need to go into the rooms realizing that teens are coming from the perspective that these are good, feel good, and are helpful socially. So we have to balance our conversation, which our curriculums do. There's also bad things about not using to a teenager. Just say no, and no is very complicated. You know, and think again, what are some bad things about not using? If you say no to somebody, you might be ostracized. You might be outed. Teens may say that you're not cool. You might um, be teased. That's a hard thing for a teenager to think about. In in our world, um, oh, no worries. Um, in, in our world uh, that we that we do and we think about this, you know, we want to be able to tell teens not to use but we have to be able to understand that it's not so easy for a teen to just say no, N-O. And that's why we want to say K-N-O-W. All right, so why are some teens using, I'm going to whip through these because we are getting tight on time, flavors. There are so many different cannabis products out there with flavors and, and marketing that's very appealing to young people. Edibles like this, and they're also easy to hide from parents because parents don't realize that these are cannabis. Oops, that went twice. We've got flavors and marketing that's attractive to LGBTQ youth. For example, here's some real marketing that's clearly, and they're talking about it in terms of pride and pride day. We have people of color. Yes, that's a joint attached to a Game Boy. This is attracting young people, people of color, and so on. It's also easy to hide. If you look at this, and you may not be able to tell, but there are 10 e-cigarettes here. This is not by accident that these products look like household products, USBs, highlighters, pens, and so forth. It's to allow it, allow kids to be able to hide them from their parents. And parents often say, I didn't realize that my kid was using 
name your drug until it came out of the laundry or, or I saw the plastic container and so on, because it's hard to detect. Marketing. This is from Marin County showing Delta 8, Delta 9, and hemp that's show, sold in the stores. These are so pretty. Rope, fruity cereal. This, again, is attracting our kids. It looks like a candy shop, but these are cannabis. Just a few more. And while we might know what Delta means, doesn't mean a parent does. And it's something that we need to talk to parents about. Just a little more targeting of youth. These are e-cigarettes that are looking like juice boxes. This is not attracting adults. This is for kids. My favorite highlight, this is a highlighter. It works as a highlighter, but it's an e-cigarette. Now, these are nicotine. You've got e-cigarettes that look like all kinds of products. Looks like McDonald's. Uh, what is it? Happy meal. And you get a toy in there. That's what these look like. And the tips are where you breathe in, inhale. You've got minions that are there as well. You've got gloomy bear and boba vapes. And then my favorite, now you can get e-cigarettes that have video games embedded. And I recently learned about a Tamagotchi version. And in the Tamagotchi, if you don't inhale, if you don't vape, then the Tamagotchi dies. So ridiculous incentivization for young people to be using these products. Access, we do a, yeah, it is horrible. Thank you. Pop quiz, think in your head. What is the minimum legal age to purchase tobacco and cannabis in the US? I will give you the answer. It is 21, it is not 18. States that have legalized cannabis, Legalized it to age 21 and over tobacco was 18. It is 21. It got signed into law in December of 2019. It is 21, not 18. And California signed into law tobacco 21 in 2016. So when you see young people who are not being carded, who are able to get these products at 17, 18, 19, report it. That's why when I see things like this student discount, it makes me so mad because student discounts are attracting. Most students are under 22, right? That's when you graduate college. Most students are under 21. And so we need to really work on, um, it, you can send it to me. I, I can't remember the exact name I have it in my files, um, but we you can report it to the FDA. You could also report it to your local Department of Public Health authorities. Please do. There was some, uh, I live in San Mateo, um, even though I'm in New York right now, live in San Mateo, and we've re reported some shops. We have um, Tobacco 21 forms. Um, it is, it, well, not so much as, it depends on where you're living and stuff. They can have, they can't have coupons for cigarettes, but they can for e-cigarettes. So it depends. Also in California, you're not supposed to sell flavored products, but they do. It's really hard to get around these, these laws. We need better enforcement. And that's where you come in. Tobacco 21, we just print, uh, publish some of these new Tobacco 21 ads that you can show around your neighborhoods and get people to realize that it's age 21. And then finally ending with stress. Young people are so stressed out right now. We need to help them. And when teens are stressed, they're more likely to use tobacco. So I mentioned this earlier, but there's uh, tobacco and cannabis. They're so much more likely to use when they're stressed out. We need to talk to teens about healthier options in coping with stress. And we need to not stigmatize young people around stress. Let's not shame. Let's not blame. Let's work with young people and help them rather than have them turn to drugs. So we have a perfect storm of youth-friendly products that are easy to hide, very high THC and nicotine, lots of misperceptions. They come in flavors and packaging that's very attractive to young people and they're harmful. So what can you do? Just in my last minute, based, you really need to do um, honest science education that's based in how teens learn and very important about um, how teens learn and keeping teens safe. We need to remember the continuum in any group that people have used and not used. We need to normalize drug education, not dr drug use. 
We need to have a conversation, not a confrontation, not a lecture. It's not tomorrow at 10 p.m. Let's sit down and have a conversation about drugs. It's not a lecture. Let's talk about it organically. Stuff. So we've got a bunch of free curriculums. I think somebody's going to put in the chat, the website, but you can also get to it through the QR code. We've got so many, all free. I'm not selling you anything here. We've got curriculums from inter prevention, intervention, secondary prevention, all across the board there. We have Safety First, which is our comprehensive drug education curriculum that includes every drug under the sun. We have our Healthy Futures alternative to uh, alternative to suspension to help young people quit and they get a certificate of completion when they're done with the course. We also, by the way, have a fentanyl prevention curriculum as well on our website. Um, yeah, I'll go through all those questions. And then the cannabis conference, this is the one thing we charge for, but you can use two pay funds. Um, this is our sixth annual and we've expanded this year beyond cannabis to include all forms of nicotine, fentanyl, hallucinogens and other substances. This is really important. Please come to it, register. If you can, it's virtual. If you cannot attend live, don't worry, it gets recorded and you can see it for an entire year. Unless you want CMEs or CEUs, then you have to come live. Follow us on social media. And there is my email and a link to sign up for our listserv um, and to see our curriculums. Thank you so much, Dr. Bonnie. There was one question um, asking for a little more information about cannabinoid hyperemesis. How yeah. do they get help as a school nurse? This is from a school nurse. Sure. So, you know, it's a great question. And if you email me, I can put you in touch with our adolescent medicine docs. I don't know exactly how they get help. I, I think some of it is just diagnosing fluids is what I'm understanding, that they're given fluids and then they are um, it'll stabilize and then set home. So generally going to the ER. Great. But if you want, email me and I'll help you with more. Yes, and we will be sending out the recordings, the resources, contact information so you can get in touch about additional questions that you might have. And I just want to give a big thank you to Dr. Bonnie for all of this incredible information. Please do take a look at their website. There is just so much incredible resources for, um, for teachers, for supporters, for parents. So take a look, um, you'll be amazed by how much deep work has been done in this area. Um, so thank you. And I'm gonna try to just- Oh, oh let oh. me, oh, I stopped sharing. You should be able to share. I should be able to share. I just wanted to have some final words. We have some more upcoming webinars that we'd like to make sure that you know about. Um, I hopefully you can see that now upcoming webinars um we'll put those links in the the chat as well we also have an aces learning community um, opportunity for school-based health centers that want to integrate a screening um that will also be sent out and it's now been dropped in the chat and we have additional resources on our our website that are specific to well many different topics under the area of providing school-based health services and in particular around starting a wellness center or school-based health center and best practices. Um, so those resources are available as well, free for you. Um, again, thank you. This is my contact information. I'm the Behavioral Health Project Director at the California School-Based Health Alliance, and you have the email address to get in touch with Dr. Bonnie as well. Um, thank you. We're right on time. I know Bonnie has to run off to another presentation, so um, final thank you to her. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.